Welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Club. My name is Jessamy G. I'm joined by my beautiful co-host, Alice Eady. Welcome, Alice. Hello. I'm very excited for our conversation today. Just got to say it. Me too, because today we're joined by a wonderful guest, Yamini Naidu. Welcome, Yamini. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jessamy, and thank you, Alice, for having me. It's lovely to have you. And we, our paths have kind of crossed a number of times number over of times. the years. Yeah. Um, I've been your graphic recorder yeah. for, I don't know, I want to say at least two or three Yeah, I think events. every creative uh, conference. Oh, yes, the, um, I said creative, creative innovation. innovation. Creative innovation, yeah, that's the one. Creative innovation <laughs> conference, correct, correct. Yes. And how brilliant and talented are you? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And right back at you, yeah. girl. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we'll include you in a moment, Alice. <laughs> Tell me something nice I can say about Alice. <laughs> nah, nah, I think I'll just hold on to this moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'll savour it. It'll be in the preview, you know, when you say coming up in this podcast, it'll just be that sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Aww. You're beautiful. I love you, Alice. Don't worry. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All about, all about the external validation. Yeah. <laughs> Craving approval, yeah. I know. So, Yamini, the way this podcast starts mm. is that we ask Alice guests to read their own bio so would you indulge us please (laughs) i love it i just think it's fabulous it's very meta and perfect for your podcast i felt really challenged because i was listening to one of your previous podcasts and one of your guests said we always write our bio on the third person because we hand it over to somebody else and i thought okay in this instance i am reading my bio which is very unusual so why don't i write it in the first person so i took a difficult thing and i made it practically impossible (laughs) (laughs) so i'm going to try and read this great as best as I can. Uh, and, I'm, and I thought, why don't I play it with some of my strengths? So I remember when I was 10, my teacher, Ms. Asha, came into the classroom and she asked us to think of a sentence. And she said the sentence could only have 10 words. Each of those words could only have two letters and the sentence had to make sense. 10 words, two letters, a sentence that had to make sense. We tried and we tried and we came up with nothing. She then wrote up on the board, if it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me. So that day, Ms. Asha influenced a classroom full of children to think differently about life, but not just in that moment or for that day, for the rest of our lives. That was my first brush with influence, and I was hooked. So much so that 15 years ago, I co-founded a company that did just one thing. It specialized in the oldest form of influence, in storytelling. So here I am, I'm an economist by training. Please don't stop listening now. (laughs) (laughs) And my personal tag, so my X factor or my tag is, I'm the world's only economist turned Bollywood dancing business storyteller. Yay! (laughs) But the world, but not the last. (laughs) Not the last, hopefully, hopefully. The first of many to come. Thank you, Alice. My clients include Google, Atlassian, Goldman Sachs, Ford Motor Company. And one of my clients, Peter Baines, the founder of Hands Across Water, said, Yamini is to storytelling like apple is to pie. Oh, thank you, Peter. My mum couldn't have said it better. (laughs) I don't know how to weave in that I've won awards, I've published six books, including a bestseller, except by telling you I don't know how to weave that in and promptly doing so. (laughs) So I work with leaders, helping them shift from spreadsheets to story. If that sounds like you, I would love to be of service. I'm on a quest to make everyone in the world a better storyteller. Thank you. Thank That's you it. so much. Yeah. I was very curious to hear your bio, knowing that you are a, a professional storyteller. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's it going to be? Yeah. She's going to tell us a story. And she did. <laughs> Yay. And it's, it's just amazing how the setup of a story, like you start your, I was in that classroom, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's just like it triggers a thing in my brain where straight away I'm, I, I feel like a kid. I'm like, and, and yeah. then what happens? And like, what does the teacher say? And yeah. <laughs> Takes you to that moment, yeah, doesn't it? It yeah. creates that experience. It's very experiential. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing that I noticed is I was like, oh, I didn't realize we'd started we'd started yet. I yeah. thought this was like a preamble to the bio. But then I was like, oh, no, no, no this, this is, is the bio this written in first person. So yeah, I always have my bio written in third person, but that's just like, wow. <laughs> so when you are providing a bio 
that's not to be read out but <laughs> yeah, on your own yeah, on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how do you weave in that beautiful storytelling that you showed us now? Yeah. Is that possible to do it in the third person um, that way? Or? It could be. Usually it happens if that person already knows your work and they share mm. a story about you and your work. Sure. But I always like them to set a really low bar when they're introducing me. So then there's an element of surprise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's not good if they're like, you know, gushing or raving. And That's, yeah, that yeah. is a hot tip. I'm writing Next. this down. Yeah. Low bar. Say the low bar. I know, say the low bar. <laughs> so they were, yeah, they say, oh, we heard Yamini speak and we decided to invite her back. And this is me, I always make a joke. I say, because you believe in continuous improvement. <laughs> so, you know, then there's that play off. And it's yeah. really awkward because as a speaker, you know, Jessamy, you've got to stand and look at the audience while you're being introduced. So someone's reading mm. your bio, everyone's looking at you, and you've got to appear moderately modest and like, oh, that's completely new information, when it's so not, you know. <laughs> it's like so many layers and you're smiling at the audience. I find I'm quite awkward at that point. I'm incredibly awkward. But if I go early and make a joke and get the audience to relax. What's uh, the turning point for you when you're presenting? And I think it's obviously everyone gets it to a different degree, like nerves before speaking to a group sure. of people. When when does that turn for you? Uh, I, I would say I get really excited. I get nervous about being able to serve my audience. Mm. It turns when I've done the research and the prep and I'm really prepped. So I've spoken mm. to members of the audience. I ring up and speak. I don't just, I obviously get briefed by the organizer and the CEO and the leaders, but I actually will ring and speak to about three or four members of the audience because I want to get a complete picture of what I'm, of a complete perspective. Um, and that really helps. I always start strong, um, but that's because I look so different. So for me, the bar is much higher. So this is, again, the thing about imposter syndrome. Mm. So I'm practically, I'm one of two, I think, female Indian speakers in Australia. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we're not many of us. One of a couple, I'd say now. Mm. Two who are CSPs, credited, certified speaking professionals. That's mm-hmm. what I'm saying, one of two. So as soon as people see me, there's already that barrier. They don't know if my English is going to be good, if I'm going to be engaging, if I'm going to be funny. Uh, so it's really hard up there on stage with that minority status. Mm. So I find with Australian audiences, if you can make them laugh and make them laugh early, then they relax into your message and into you and they go, it's not going to be bad. You know, there's something here. So I always believe, and this would be my advice for all speakers, particularly women, always start strong, start with fire. Mm. Yeah. I start love that. with fire. Start, start with fire, yeah. Love it. Um, Yamini, I'm interested, I mean, as storytelling is your thing, in hearing a little bit more about your story. Yeah. Um, starting from wherever you choose, maybe not, <laughs> oh no, actually starting with birth probably would be good. Um, but I know that you, you'd studied in India before yeah. you came to Australia. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. and I'm very, very, very interested by the economist turned Bolly, <laughs> Bollywood dancing storyteller. Um, so yeah, maybe if you could just sure. tell us a bit of your story, sure. that would be wonderful. Uh, so obviously I grew up in Bombay, India, and I love that. And I draw in it it was a wonderful time, very happy childhood. But sometimes, you know, later in life, you feel unhappy because you think a happy childhood is not always good for an artist. You know? <laughs> so, you know. I have yeah. definitely had that thought. Like, oh, yeah. God, my parents just love me too much. They That's why I'm shit at this. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's not so good to be, you know, to, to have that. So, yeah. So a little bit of childhood angst would have been good. <laughs> no, no. Deeply grateful for that. When I was about five, I used to take a big red bus and go to the go to school every day. Imagine five-year-old, they would let you get on this big bus with a whole lot of other children. It was a public bus. It wasn't a private school bus. And on that bus, I used to always imagine the bus was a tiger. Uh, and, you know, that was my sort of first thing with like being imaginative with storytelling. I obviously studied economics. I went to London School of Economics. I got a scholarship. I met my husband when he was on holidays in India. So we fell in love and that's how I married and moved to Melbourne, Australia. Oh, wow. So many years ago. So that's how I came to Australia. Love brought me here. Um, and initially when I... <laughs> I, I remember when I landed at Melbourne Airport, like on the way over here, I was thinking this is going to be really different. You might know a lot of Indian people don't eat beef. Mm-hmm. And here I was moving to the barbecue capital of the world. Oh, yeah. The plane lands at Almerine Airport. I grab my luggage out of the carousel. I step out and the first thing I see is a dusty white ute. And across the back is a bumper sticker. And the bumper sticker says, this is cattle country. Eat beef, you bastards. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That was my introduction to Australia. Where am I? (laughs) 
And um, Melbourne people love talking about the weather. Alice, did you find this to be? They love it. But oh. they're not just talking about the weather, complaining about the weather. Oh. It doesn't matter. Obsessing about the weather. Yeah, it's either too hot or it's too cold, yeah. but there's this or unity or... brought about by complaining about the weather here. <laughs> that is a cultural, it's a very cultural thing. It's a very thing. strong cultural mm. preference, isn't it? Was mm. that a thing for you in South Africa? No. The weather no. is just like a thing that's happening and it's It's just fine. in the background. Yeah. Spot on. Same with me. Came from India with zero weather conversation. But, you know, you learn. You learn to do weather talk. <laughs> do you know why I think that is? I think it's because we're, I don't, and I don't know why, but we're in like complete denial about the weather. It's like every single winter we're shocked oh, that it's fucking cold. It's like, but this is meant to be Australia. It's meant to be sunshine. Like I've lived yeah. in Melbourne my entire yeah. life yeah. Yeah. and I still do that every oh, Oh, I mean, can you can you believe it? there was frost on the car this morning? That's frost, exactly. yeah, I know. yeah, it happens every year, babe. It happens every <laughs> single fucking year. <laughs> Do you think it's also safe? It's a very safe conversation to have, and quite likely, you know, it's quite neutral and relatively objective. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. It's a it's the smallest of small talk, isn't it? <laughs> you know, we should all be in a small talk diet, you know, especially yeah. post COVID. <laughs> Oh yeah. my god! I was just talking to, I caught up with a friend of mine yeah, on Sunday because he's about to go to Europe. One of the many like people doing their redo trips yeah, that they yeah, didn't get to do during yeah. COVID, and we're having exactly that conversation that we just have zero appetite for small. I mean, neither of us were particular, particularly Good. big small talkers <laughs> to begin with. We're more big talkers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, just saying like I can't. Just can't do it anymore. It can't just feels it. like life's too short. Yeah. Whatever right? little practice we had rusted away and fell away. Yeah. No COVID, yeah. Like, yeah. But I think it's a gift. Yeah. You want small talk. So, anyway, sorry. Go oh, on. Okay. Yeah. I, my brain is going in two different directions, oh. but um, I have so many questions, but I just want to picture you arriving. How old were you? Uh, I was in my 20s. Oh, so I wasn't okay. that young. Okay. Similar to you. So I did work in a, in, a corporate, in a corporate role for a long time and, you know, did all the things. And I think that's when I felt imposter syndrome the most. Because when you're a new migrant, all you want to do is to fit in and to assimilate. There was a wonderful article in the Weekend Age about uh, the huge boom in the Indian demographic in Melbourne, in Victoria, in Australia, which is a new thing. And they said Indians always have this capacity to dissolve like sugar in milk. So to like really blend in and become, make everything mm-hmm. sweeter. So that's a huge advantage. But also then you're not, you're not being 100% authentic. Yeah. Um, the, the article also said, and this is so true, we have a capacity to live in two worlds, to be really Indian mm-hmm. at home and, you know, really blend in and be Western at work. So I think with that corporate career, I always felt that imposter syndrome. But being mm-hmm. inauthentic would be how I'd say it. So about being an economist, <laughs> about 15 years ago, I read a book by Stephen Denning, and it's called The Leader's Guide to Storytelling. And as an econ, that just fried my brain, seeing the word leader and storytelling, like in a title. Mm. But I was so hungry for answers because data is so boring. Like we've all sat through tedious presentations and nobody's persuaded or engaged or, you know, um, moved to act. So I devoured the book. And when I got off that plane, I rang a couple of leaders and they all said two things. They said, we know good leaders tell stories. We don't know how to. Mm. So I immediately started Googling. Like how, because I wanted to learn the skill of storytelling. So I'm talking quite a while ago, maybe 2005. So there were only two things available. There was the book by Denning, and he had also written a Harvard Business Review article. So I often think the best way to learn something is to teach it. Mm. And I've always wanted to work for myself because then I thought I could be more authentic to who mm. I am. And um, that's when I co-founded Australia's first storytelling company. And within 30 days, National Australia Bank was our first client. So they'd all just come back from America on a trip and they'd heard storytelling was this big buzzword and they couldn't find anybody apart from us. And now I blush with shame when I think of that first workshop we did. <laughs> you know, it was just like barely there, you know. <laughs> but it was good enough. Yeah. It was that step ahead of our clients. And then, of course, with each workshop you grow, you develop mm. your own IP, you start to uh, be more confident with your ideas and... Uh, it's but it's that cold face experience with clients that I think really helps helps you get over your self doubt mm-hmm. helps you they give you assurance that this works yeah yeah absolutely and I think well two things firstly I think if you don't have some like cringe when you look back on your first <laughs> things that's bad because it means you haven't grown yeah. at all since delivering yeah. that which would be a terrible yeah. thing so I feel the same way looking back at my like early graphic yeah. recording work I'm just like oh god this brings me like physical pain <laughs> but it's good because it means that we've yeah. grown right yeah 
Um, and the other thing, which which was something that I'd wanted to explore with you a little bit, is around you know things like developing your own IP. And yeah. I know that you, you know, identify as a, as a thought leader, and you've yeah. been a thought leader in the storytelling yeah. world for a long time. Yeah. There is sort of a point, like obviously some things are, are based in in research and that yeah. sort of thing. But also, when you're developing your, your new IP, by its very nature, it's new, right? Yeah. You're breaking new ground, and so there is um, an element of like we're going to sort of throw this out there and see what sticks. Is imposter syndrome something that showed up for you around that time or because you were working so much at the coalface, did that help diminish um, that a little? A bit of both. It really always shows up. You're worried about... Uh, yeah, this our, is sorry. It's garbage day, yeah. and the garbage truck has unfortunately come late today. Yeah. But uh, that's all right. We'll that's just all right. You know, we'll plow through. Yeah, yeah. The nature feel, of life. I mean, on the upside, we know that the council is working to take your time. Yeah, urban life is ticking, ticking over. So. Yeah. That was a real long bow, Alice. But I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. That's like, what it takes. There, the garbage truck. There has yeah. to be a silver lining yeah. that we can like tenuously yeah. extract from Physical proof from that we're not. We're not dissolved down into anarchy. The garbage yeah. truck's idea. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's hope. It gives us hope. It's not a garbage truck. It's a, it's a beacon of hope. hope. Yeah. Exactly. Not today. Yeah. Not well, today. Girls, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> garbage truck symbol uh, of hope. Anyway, sorry, Yamini, please always, continue. Uh, you know, you're always plagued by self-doubt whenever you start to write a book. Yeah. Because you're then drawing a line in, your, in the sand. Hmm. You're saying it might be this, it might be that, but I am saying it is this. Mm. And my research, which is my writing, my work with my clients, my reading, my interviewing, informs this. Uh, so there's always that. And, and I think actually in this instance, doubt is a fierce friend. Absolutely, you should feel that doubt, as long mm. as it's not debilitating. I do use a couple of things to help me. I always work with a mentor. I always obviously get my books you know, professionally edited, proofread. Mm. But at the start of um, 2020, we five of us formed a writer's group. And I can't, uh, for all creatives, some sort of mastermind group that you form where you meet regularly. We meet every Monday at 8 o'clock for an hour. We punch through stuff. Everybody gets, you know, 10 minutes. We punch through whatever is holding us up with our writing, where are we at, keeping accountable, whatever it is. Nothing is too big or small. And that really helps you work through your self-doubt, clarify your IP. And then, of course, you invite first readers. So I send out my book mm. to three or four clients or readers. So you go through all that and it's, it's a baptism of fire. But I think what keeps you honest and what keeps you going is there's so much, you want to put out something that would be useful for people. Yeah. For me, that's mm -hmm. it. If this book can be of service to one of my, my audience, then I feel I've done my job. Yeah. But that's not easy to do because we can all be in ivory towers with our IP and we can get a bit precious and not mm. want to kill our darlings and go, mm. no, no, you know, this metaphor really works when it doesn't. Or um, I think it's such a, also a useful frame to have to get you out of your head and out of doubt because similar to what you were saying about speaking mm. in front of a group of people, that anxiety is coming from us being being afraid we're going to embarrass ourselves yeah, somehow, yeah. but that's us fixating on us. That's ego getting in the way. And if, if you think about it as an act of service, like you're the vessel for something yeah. bigger and more useful that does, it just takes it. Yeah. I mean, firstly, it's a more generous way of living. It just feels yeah, better, yeah. but it also takes you out of your head because then it isn't about you. That's it's it. about them. And it's like, yeah. okay, I'm going to, I'll do the best thing I can to offer you what I've got right now to offer. And that's, that's like a it. completely different thing to being yeah. like, I need to perform for you right now. And, yeah. you know, it's it's like the me show. That's it. Yeah. And also, we sh uh, you know, like we take responsibility for that moment, but you're not, they're going to have other opportunities to learn about whatever you're talking mm. about all through their yeah. lives. So every bit of it is not like, you know, the weight of the world is not on your shoulders. Yeah. So I think that can really free us up. I had a really interesting moment, like in 2008, when I... Uh, Entered, I was invited by this investment bank to present to their leaders and I entered the room. <laughs> it's just like a sea of pale male faces and I'm like young, I'm Indian, I'm brown, I'm uh, a woman, I'm the only woman in the room. Uh, and that's when I had this just like this huge, like almost a punch in the guts thinking, oh my God, like we're so different. Like what can we have? And they probably were thinking that as well. Like what can we have in common? But that's when I felt, what can I do to serve the room? And yeah. that helped me shift out of that yeah. uh, feeling, you know, 
imposter is sure. And also feeling like they've invited you. So obviously, even if you have self-doubt about your own judgment, trust other people's judgment. I am. Um, can we? I have so so many questions, but can we skip back? <laughs> please, I, please. I get. I love getting really granular yeah, yeah, on yeah, like yeah. the the nerdy, yeah, yeah, like ritual yeah. and structure side of things. So this group. What, how did you? It's a group of mentors, or what? No, your, no, it's a group of writers. Writers. Okay, so like, how how do you think about this? How do you structure this? What do these meetings yeah. look like? And and like, what do you bring to them? What do you leave with? Like, sure. can you describe? Sure. So it started mornings. off quite organically with four of us and we thought we should meet regularly to write together because as you know writing is all about discipline you've got to show up do the work and some it's hard to do, do it. it's solo work it's sort of head down bum up you've just got to keep writing until you get it done like I normally get up early and I'll do 1500 words every day and then when I'm done I just have a sense of achievement whether it's good <laughs> words bad words doesn't matter yeah Just put them down and down. So that's how we started. So we'd meet physically face-to-face in Carolyn's house, actually. And then COVID struck. And so we decided to go to Zoom. And we found Zoom wasn't as conducive for actually writing. When you're face-to-face, we would um, do the Pomodoro technique, you know, 25 minutes writing, five minutes or whatever discussion back into writing. Um, Zoom, we found that we had enough time, (laughs) endless time in Melbourne (laughs) to actually write, to get shit done. Um, what was of deep value was speaking to the experts because they're all experts in writing, getting books out, getting Mm. published, getting an agent. Anything that you needed was there in this vessel. And everybody's deeply generous. Everybody's very similar. I know you have this thing about be kind to yourself. You know, it's not your favorite (laughs) thing. (laughs) Our version of that is tough love. Yeah, okay. So we're really tough with each other. Mm. Like, And we also do it in a way that's very lovely because uh, we don't want to kill that. And some of my mm. best ideas for my book has come from there. Um, just so much of it. A couple of things help Alice. It's obviously inviting the right people. Yeah. It's keeping the group very small. I'd say no more than four or five. It's only inviting people who will commit. We're all busy, mm. but you've got to show up regularly, whatever that looks like. I'd say ideally once a week, yeah. once a fortnight, whatever. Recently, we've started meeting face-to-face for a whole day's retreat. So last Friday was in my house. We did a writer's retreat in my house, like from 10 to 4. Oh, I and love that, this. I know. I love this. I'm it's so just jealous. a day of immersion. <laughs> and because we know we've already booked our writer's retreat, it's just in each other's homes. It sounds very glamorous. Like we're all going <laughs> off to Bali. Or, um, luckily, one of our friends does live in Wooden, So that's at least out of Melbourne. Otherwise, it's just Clifton Hill and Hawthorne and uh, uh, places yeah. like that. Uh, it just, it allow it gives you, you, you just have to give yourself that permission. You just go, I'm going to put all my work behind me. And just for that day, just focus on the art of writing, whatever that Mm. is for me on that day. Um, So you literally go around, whatever people need, they put it out there and the group responds. Sometimes they just need to talk and work through. And while they're talking, they get that insight. Yeah. Does that help? Oh, so so much. So much. Interestingly, Carolyn Tate, whom you uh, is, is writing a book called Brave Women Write, and in there, we're doing a blurb about writers' groups because any time any one of us mention it, the audience just wants to know more about what is this writers' group. And, and my wish in my book, I'm, I've written, I'm, I have only one wish for every author is they find a writers' group like mine. Ah, oh, that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And really for every creative. Because yeah. creative work is lonely, would you say, Jasmine? It's very 100%, lonely. One hundred percent. Yeah, and look, you know, our, our work as graphic recorders, you're almost one hundred percent of the time working alone. alone. I mean, l- like you would as a speaker, yeah. you are in a room with people, but yeah. you're not collaborating. Yeah. You don't have that chance for feedback. Um, and I thought that was really that's a, such an important thing is have having people that you trust and feel safe around yeah. to be able to both give and receive constructive feedback yeah. from. And I think that's um, when you're in a, a job that is so solo, yeah. those uh, those moments when you can find them are just are just golden and they're really the only way that you can grow and improve. Um, yeah, so I think yeah. that's really special. And sometimes we just read out our writing to the others and get some love back, which is lovely as yeah. well. It's lovely hearing people's voices and reading. Yeah. Oh, for me, it's also the sound of other people's keyboards, yeah. just that, that like, it's like a <laughs> babbling brook of typing. <laughs> and when I'm in a space where I hear that, I'm just, it just, makes it so much easier yeah. somehow my fingers are typing and I'm I'm doing oh. the work it's like a buoyed along by that kind Lovely, of that energy, momentum yeah yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful yeah 
So I have. Do you have some questions? <laughs> you, you're you're bursting, bursting at the seams. So you oh go God, for it. I am bursting. <laughs> while we have you here, while we have an expert on storytelling, yeah. um, of course we'd love to ask you what makes a good story. Yeah. But before that, Yay. what makes a bad story? <laughs> what makes a bad storytelling or a bad storyteller? What are the red flags, <laughs> the first things that you see cropping up either in individuals or in organizations sure. that you're just like, nope, stop that straight away. <laughs> stop it right now. I know. Uh, in organizations, it's when they try to do story by committee, you know, oh, they think, yes. oh, what's the story of our whole organization? That's too boring because then there's no single protagonist. You can't get the story oh, out. Interesting. The other thing is when we drop into our business selves, we try to put jargon in or we're very businessy about it. I find you have to go personal to find rich stories, even in organization, because at the end of the day, you're dealing with customers, you're dealing with team members, you're dealing with, you know, board members. Everybody's a person. You've got to go personal. And the third thing is the stakes have got to matter. So someone talking about, you know, the latte not being hot enough, <laughs> you know, which is a problem, which can be a problem. I get it. It just comes across like privilege. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. a bit like our weather conversation. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and we all complained about, before COVID, we used to complain about lattes not being hot. Now we're just grateful for our lattes. Mm. And, yeah. Going outside. Yeah, going out. Little things exactly. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, for, just for humble, yeah. small things, yeah. yeah. So I think those three things, trying to do it by committee, trying to be too businessy about it. Or, mm. And um, I've forgotten the third. Stakes. <laughs> yeah, stakes. 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 Yeah. 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 I think it's an interesting, and sorry, um, Alice, I'll, I'll throw it back to you in a moment, mm. but um, the point you bring up about trying to be too businessy about it, I imagine could be quite tricky. And also I know that you're, um, the next thing that you're working on is all around authenticity. What sort of issues arise when you're kind of, when you're essentially selling authenticity as a service, it seems kind of counterintuitive. So in those um, how am I trying, trying to phrase this question right? Like when you are doing storytelling with corporates, how yeah, do you yeah. try and help them make it less corporate? Or when you are um, trying to help someone find, you know, connect more to their authentic self in yeah. the workplace, but in a way that is is in a reasonably sort of c- contrived environment. Sure. How do you sort of fight through those barriers? Sure. It's always about going personal, but understanding the difference between going personal and going private. Mm, so we think of like, yeah. we almost have four selves. There's the public self, there's the professional self. And quite often we get stuck in the professional selves. We used to at least, now things are better. There's the personal self and then there's the private self. So you as a storyteller, to keep yourself safe, you have to decide what is private for you and what you won't share. Um, mm. And once you ascertain that, then it's easy for you to then do just go personal. Personal can be as simple as, you know, going shopping in Bunnings or dropping your kids off to school or getting bullied in year seven and then relating that to some sort of business message. So this is all about us just humanizing business, um, business more, more mm. and more. Does that help? I don't know. It yeah. really helps. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that... that um, differentiation between personal and private. and private like we've all had a friend who's overshared on facebook i was <laughs> as you're saying that i'm like oh that's that's me no i'm no, sorry no, like friend. do i have that line Whoops, better go through my entire timeline i'm like this is a very useful metric i think i'm making a career out of blurring those. <laughs> but maybe you've just got a very small private self yeah, you know yeah yeah, yeah, it yeah, is, yeah i mean sort of jokes aside though it's a it is a very it's not about there being a right or wrong place for Correct. that line, but very yeah. much just being self-aware enough to know where it is for you. Because Correct. I think it's also that feeling after you've had a few glasses of wine and you wake <laughs> up in the morning with that regret. Of, yeah. I think that's when like when we're not necessarily sure mm. where that line nice. is for us and you feel that slightly uncomfortable feeling because you've crossed it without even being aware quite what you've done or like yeah, how, yeah. why it feels a bit weird. So, so true. And it's that blurriness mm. no, that we, either you've got to live with that unease or it's, it's a constantly shifting line as well. Like yes. say with your personal, with of your close course. friends or family, you know, it might be very little, but say mm. in a professional context, that private circle might be bigger as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. I wonder, um, speaking of oversharing on Facebook, <laughs> yes. with the sort of <laughs> next, <laughs> next generation coming through, I wonder how different those borders might be for them because they will have grown up 
oversharing. You know, they will have grown up with so much of their private lives online. I mean, we just sort of narrowly yeah, missed elite, out on yeah. that, you know, um, <laughs> which I'm so Thank fucking grateful for. Thanks the Lord. Um, Thank God. I remember yeah. like the conversations that I had, or like I even occasionally when I'm at my dad's house, will find like old diaries or like letters I've written to friends. I'm like, if this was on the internet, <laughs> I would just like walk slowly into the ocean and never return. <laughs> It'd be an internet sensation. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder, you know, that, that could be yeah. interesting for yourself or people in roles like you um will that make a difference to things or how we do storytelling or how we coach people or how people show up in business sure we just hope there's a higher level of confidence and being your authentic self and i think covid maybe has helped because we've got used to seeing you know people's kids and zoom meetings and that acceptance of the whole is much more there Mm. Uh, coming back to the personal and the private uh, as creatives everything we put out is personal that's why it's so hard. That's why we get played by self-doubt. and Because, you know, every time you put out something, it's it's you. You're putting yourself out there, which is what makes it really hard. Mm. Which is why to stay safe, you've got to decide what's private and what you yeah. want to share. It just helps you not burn out as an artist, I think. It helps mm. you long term and it helps you regenerate yeah. as well. My sister described it as um, a vulnerability hangover. I'm, and I'm sure she picked that up. I don't know if that's her word, eh? but I'm sure, yeah, yeah, anything that starts with vulnerability. But, but that idea of, yeah, that feeling of maybe having crossed that line without knowing, knowing that you've it. crossed that line for yourself. But that's yeah. also where your edge work lies. You've got to take those risks sometimes. Like you've got to cross that line. Like with Bollywood dancing. So like, you know, I've said, the world's only economist and business storyteller. That I lived with for 10 years. And I always just do Bollywood dancing as a bit of a throw way and energizer it took working with two mentors for me to realize this is something I could integrate into my presenting so I actually do three messages and I teach them three dance moves so then we anchor it through dance Um, it's not like I'm just wildly dancing randomly on stage (laughs) I would be totally here for that (laughs) that could work too especially after a few wives but it's taken that long because mm. of what you're saying. It's, you know, letting them see my more private self. Now, the way I dance in an actual party mm. or a wedding would be completely wild and uninhibited and everyone knows the step. It's different. So it's, you know, I'm channeling a, not a more sanitized, but maybe a more palatable version, mm. uh, version mm. of that. So it's interesting seeing like that depth or that unfolding mm. uh, happening. And uh, hopefully as artists, and always, um, I must tell you, I was reading Trent, um, Trent Dalton, who wrote The Boy Who Swallowed the Universe. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's got a beautiful book, which has been out a little while. And it's just like a, a precious gem. It's called Love Stories. So in 2021, so last year, in the middle of the pandemic in Brisbane, he sits down in one of the busiest squares in Brisbane with a blue Olivetti typewriter. And he's got a sign that says, writer seeking love stories. And strangers just stop and they share. And everyone says, I don't have a love story. And they all promptly do. And he's just beautiful. There's a little YouTube video of uh, his that you could watch. And he's just collected all these love stories. And Aww. he's published this little book, which is pink and gold. And, uh, and some of the stories are really moving. Some are unresolved. Some are leave you feeling very conflicted. But it's such a gem. The whole thing... It just, you know, even though we live in such a cynical age and everyone's very sort of savvy and sophisticated and street, this just cuts through all that. Mm. It just makes you a mushy marshmallow. I'm sharing this because I thought, look at his courage as an artist. To put him out, put him out for, I think he did it for two months wow. with a sign showing up every day in the rain, in the cold. Does it rain in Brisbane? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're channeling Melbourne weather. <laughs> um, Speaking to strangers and then doing something with yeah. it. So it's that, you know, it's that always that pushing that, but yeah. knowing what works. Yeah. Showing up again and again, but again to your point of like against cynicism, because I, yeah. there's so many, he could have shown up with that typewriter to tell numerous stories. And of course, it's important to have stories of fear and stories of trauma yeah. like it's very important to share those but it's yeah. equally important to just also show up for the love stories yeah. as kind of cliche as yeah. as you might feel doing it because that's part of the experience and it's it yeah it's the other beautiful. thing about love everyone has a love story could be your parents your neighbor your friend's wedding mm. so I felt it was very inclusive it was very universal mm. And people are more likely to open up and share that. Whereas if you, you know, wanted to talk about the grief that people have been through, that's much harder. Yeah. And then you 
also have to be careful how you do that because you obviously mm. don't want to trigger people. I was just going to say, yeah. it's quite unfair to yeah. get someone to open that box up. And yeah. then when you're not a trained uh, yes, therapist. And, and that can yeah. feel, yeah, because there's so many other factors of not wanting to be exploitative sure. versus when it's a love story. Sorry, it's just beautiful. Yeah, just yeah. on so many levels for me, that just felt like one of the highest levels of art mm. I've ever seen. That's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely gorgeous. I wonder what different types of love stories he got to. Like it could be, like I always say that Alice is one of the great loves of my oh, life. <laughs> so you know, so, like not, not all great loves are romantic, yeah, you know. Right. Also my, my, my yeah. dogs and, you know, yeah, yeah, my, my friend my loves. I feel yeah. so honoured to be included with your <laughs> dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Dan hasn't got a gun yet. <laughs> Yamini, you were witnessing yeah, I'm a witnessing moment. a moment, a group hug. <laughs> you never thought this would happen. The highest compliment is just being paid. <laughs> Once I am, um, speaking of my dogs being the highest compliment, um, you know they have people say that like dogs look like their owners yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I was at the... Um, I was at the gym once when Chi Chi was a little puppy and, and took it. So I was at like my height of obsessed with her because she was <laughs> tiny and gorgeous. And a friend of mine, Haley, said, "Oh, you know, they you know they say that thing. Dogs look like their owners. I totally see that with you and Chi Chi." I was just like, <gasps> "Oh my god, this is the best compliment I've ever received in my life. <laughs> this is a transformation, transformative yeah. movement. I'll never be the same. I'm only going to pick good looking dogs." <laughs> yeah. so honestly, like to this day, I the hope highest Maggie's compliment. a good looking dog. <laughs> She's gorgeous. She's oh. feral. <laughs> and we look just like each other. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. Yeah. So, so Yamini Lee, uh, sort of bouncing off that love stories um, idea then. So what makes a good story? <laughs> <laughs> All of those things, like having a single protagonist, having something that you and your audience can care about. Like with a love story, we always want to know, how does it turn out? You know, does a boy win the girl to be really mm. gender biased with our traditional love stories? <laughs> um, will they get their heart broken? You always want that, the audience and they, you always want that level of intrigue. Mm. And I always like some sort of resolution. Mm. Uh, whatever that might be. It doesn't always have to be a happy resolution, yeah. some sort of resolution. In business, I'm much more precise. I always say your stories have to have a purpose. There's to be a message. Your stories have got to be authentic. You can't yeah. make up stuff. I don't know if you're Seinfeld fans. Dodge mm-hmm. Costanza doesn't think it's true because I believe it. <laughs> you can't do that with your stories. That have to actually be true. <laughs> and then I always say Dada is the hero. So wherever you want, um, wherever possible, your stories to support Dada. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and- do you work with um, Do you work with any kind of models? I know there's the there's Joseph Campbell's yeah, Hero's, the Hero's Journey. Journey. That's, that's a classic old story. Most storytelling fits within that bottle. Yeah, yeah. And we've all got our own version of it. There's also the heroine's journey, uh, which is a different, a quite quite a different journey. And you know, both might oh. be quite yeah oh, because please, it does. Can yeah, you could look you... it up. I I can't, I can't. I don't remember. But there is that you know falling off a cliff and those self doubt and the. Yeah. So it's, it's much more descriptive and it's quite different to the hero's journey. Interesting. I've the never hero, heard of this. I know. See, it's, it's very less, it's lesser known. Amazing. We yeah. love, we love some homework. So <laughs> yeah. that'll be. Heroin. How do you say the word? Heroin. 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 Yeah. Heroin. Okay. Like not the drug, but not heroin the drug. journey. Yeah. <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the heroin's journey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested, Yamini. And so there is the type of storytelling that we do to communicate, to get a point across, to influence, persuade, whatever that might be. But then there's another form of storytelling which we do to ourselves and that can be positive stories or negative stories. And I think essentially imposter syndrome, right, is a series of negative stories that everyone else Mm. knows what they're doing and I don't, I'm going to get found out. Mm. And then, you know, the flip side is we could be telling us positive, ourselves positive stories, like, you know, I'm capable and strong or whatever. Is that something that's shown up for you or in how you work with your clients at all? Totally. And it's so sad, like uh, some of the work on imposter syndrome was done initially for senior women. Mm. You know, clinicians to psychologists yeah. did the work on imposter syndrome for senior women. And I still feel it's the case. Like we yeah. still all have imposter syndrome. Shifting the narrative in your own head is very important. And this is where the power of positive self-talk, all of that comes in. 
Uh, about a year ago, I started uh, learning to draw. <laughs> so it's not something I'm very good at. I know. Wow. Yeah, I have oh, always come, dabbled. I've come to the right come place. To the right no, place. No, no, you're like, it's really, you know, uh, gobsmackingly humbling to be with you all. <laughs> I know. And I went for art classes, and it always, uh, it's like, why do you show up? Because it's, it's it just is so painful, you know, because <laughs> you're so bad at being a beginner. Mm. And that's when all of the doubt and all of that kicks in and I was talking to my sister and she said in school uh, they used to the art teachers to fling our books out of the window if you were bad at art and I was shocked because oh my, my sister's God. actually I know brutal huh? <laughs> my sister was actually good at art and she said yeah the kids who were bad at art their books were torn in half and flung out of the window I was that kid I'm sure <laughs> but I blocked it out it's okay don't be so shocked <laughs> it's all part horrifying. of that <laughs> no this is like a different gen we grew up with sure, all of that sure yeah now. but it's, yeah anyway yeah. sorry go on <laughs> my, my face is just like my jaws on the ground <laughs> yeah, like, oh, you, you precious you poor little that. artist precious. <laughs> don't worry just we just grew up tougher and rougher and more resilient um that shifting the narrative in your head is really important. One way I learned to do it is from my humor coach, Kate Burr. So she's kateburr.com. Because a lot of people don't think they're funny, particularly women. And if you speak for a living, they always say, you don't have to tell stories or be funny unless you want to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to learn. So it's definitely something you have to learn if you don't feel that's your natural yeah. Um, instinct. And Kate says the way to think about because people always go, I'm not funny, is to go, I am learning to be funny. That's so interesting because yeah. people think of it as such a you either are or you aren't. And it's the same. I mean, we've, we've spoken about this with drawing, is like people think you either can or can't draw. Correct, correct. It's, Sorry. it's just. It's literally just time and practice, practice. and awareness. So like, Showing up, doing the work. It's so interesting. So that applies yeah. to humor. What, is, what does a it. humor coach entail? Like, what is that <laughs> she journey? teaches you to be funny. She's very good at it as well. <laughs> you go to her with your content and she'll show you how to make it funny. But she'll keep it authentic to your style. But the first thing that needs to shift is the narrative in your head. And this applies for the imposter syndrome. And to just go, I am learning too. And insert whatever words. I find this works. It's much more believable for your subconscious mind than just going, I'm great. I'm awesome. Because your subconscious mind goes, no, you're not. And thinks of all these times you weren't. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I'm learning just opens up a different portal in our neural circuitry yeah. uh, that then just frees you up. I love that. And I, and I think that's something maybe not worded in exactly that way, but we've spoken about quite a lot either with each other or with other guests yeah. on the podcast that that learner's mindset of like, of course, you're not going to just step into something and be amazing at it. Like you're not just yeah, going to stand yeah. up and deliver an amazing like stand up comedy act yeah. if you've never done it before. And why should you? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that, um, phrasing of I'm learning to is so useful because it's not being like, I'm going to be great. This is going to be great. Like that sort of really like unrealistic positive self-talk is not actually helpful because you just let yourself down, right? Yeah. Yeah. You pump pump yourself up and it's not sustainable. Mm. And at some part, you know, you're lying to yourself. Mm. So I think that's really hard to live with as well. It's so interesting when you talk about comedy. I studied comedy uh, in Melbourne in the School of Hard Knock Knocks. (laughs) I think the only (laughs) but the best comedy school. (laughs) Is that really what it's called? Yeah, yeah. It's called the School of Hard Knock Knocks. That is amazing. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good because you come in for a week, you turn up every day, you literally on the first day they tell you all comedy starts by writing and everyone's like shocked. I don't know what I was imagining, but I wasn't writing. And literally the first day you do two minutes of content. You oh, actually wow. got to do your two minutes of content, whatever it is, however bad. Do you have to stand up and deliver this yeah, content? Oh, yeah. So you're not just writing it. Yeah, like you've yeah. got to perform You've just got to do class. it. Oh, you, panic, I don't know panic, you're panic, panic, panic. So, correct. And then at the end of the five days or whatever, we actually have a public performance where you invite your friends and family. So there's the pressure of public mm-hmm. performance. The two things we hate doing as adults is failing and in public. Oh, yeah. yeah. And every time you speak or you do comedy, it's presenting you that on a silver platter. It was just an interesting insight for mm. me. So how are we limiting how people can give us feedback? Mm. Also, Brenny Brown says, be careful who you ask for feedback. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you need somebody who plays in that domain. And uh, yes. you just, because everyone's happy to give feedback. But, yeah, how constructive it is really matters as well. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So when we're asking uh, ourselves for feedback. (laughs) (laughs) It's only one view. It's only one perspective. And we're always so much harsher on ourselves. Yes. I find as women, we're very harsh on ourselves and we're equally harsh on other women. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah, yes. yeah. Which is we, we hold everyone to those high standards. I do this thing that I've been doing for a long time that I always, if I see something I love, like, you know, your sparkly egg boots or uh, just random women on the street or whatever, I always give them a compliment. Uh, it's my love bomb. So I just say, you know, I love your shoe, great hair, whatever mm. it is. And it, it's so wonderful to see the response. People are always mm. taken aback and sometimes apologetic and sometimes explaining away. And like, you know, it's it's just interesting seeing. But And then I thought, you know, we're so good at love bombing others. I call it love bomb. And in my workshops, I make people practice this. So when someone shares a story, we give that person a love bomb. Because I think they're so new mm. and vulnerable with their story. They put something personal out and then I go, oh, I don't think that's a story. That's not going to work. Nobody's yeah. going to grow. I yeah. think love helps us grow. Mm. Sorry, sounds a bit naff. I can see just me going, no. no, 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 no. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with you 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 100%. Uh, then I thought there's also that opportunity for us to give ourselves love bombs. And then I was thinking about every day we do so many things for our physical health. Like, you know, you probably already exercised, you've... Uh, you know, you've eaten right, you've had your green smoothie, you've had your supplements, all of that. But if I was to ask people to list five things you do every day for your mental health, five things you do every day for your mental health, I would really struggle. Mm. Because I've thought Mm. about it, I can tell you five. Both of you tell me, what are five things you would do every day for your mental health? Um, (laughs) um, Well, I do think that I... uh, I connect with friends like every day I would I have at least one you know either phone call or or face-to-face interaction I'm lucky in that that also ties in with my physical health stuff in that a lot of my um beautiful friends yeah Yeah, my my gym buddies (laughs) yeah exactly so that's quite an easy one um other than that I don't know I mean I feel like things are quite interlinked like you say we do you know the like physical movement and eating right, but I feel like those things Absolutely, do play yeah. into mental health as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've had, a, as listeners would know, a um, terribly unsuccessful run with both journaling and meditation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never seem to be able to <laughs> stick to it. Um, yeah, so I guess the only things that really come to mind are, um, yeah, connecting with people and, and physical exercise. What about you, Alice? And that's enough. You know, you don't have yeah. to do yeah. more. But it's that conscious effort. And yeah. all the research says that social connections are the most important thing, you know. Great. Yeah. 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 Kicking goals. I think mine <laughs> mine probably, I do, the physical one is skipping, which I'm, I think I've yeah, spoken, spoken about, about before. Yeah, you've spoken about it. It's such fun. Oh, I Hope you get so back much. into it, Alice. I have, oh, actually. Very good. I have. Very Thank good. you. Yeah, I, I love it so, so much. Um, and then I also, have I spoken about the olive oil thing? This no. Is, this is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware of it, but I don't think I'm speaking <laughs> publicly about uh, it. So, um, so this, I started this about a year ago when um, I, I got divorced and yeah. I was kind of by myself and it was that awkward moment of like, it's bedtime and there's just this silence, like there's oh. no one to get in bed with. And I'm like, I need to fill this space with something good because otherwise that's when the, the nighttime spiral starts. And I kind of was like, well, it's just me here. And I was feeling so disconnected from my body and Mm -hmm. my flesh and like that whole aspect of me. And I don't know why olive oil. I think I just didn't have any moisturizer at home. And I was like, (laughs) moisturizer is just oils, like suspended in chemicals. I was like, we can cut out all the chemicals. I just Mm -hmm. went and got olive oil. And I I ended up going and I'd buy really, really nice, high quality, Mm. natural olive oil. And every night before bed, I just start at my toes and just like massage this oil like into my legs, into my whole body and just make sure that I touched Mm. all my, I mean, not probably not all of it, but actually trying really like just to like find me again in my skin and in my body. And, and it felt just so nourishing and beautiful and, and your skin absorbs. It sounds like you'd be, it sounds like it would be gross. Like you'd be this oily, your skin just like sucks it out. Yeah. And it just, it felt so, so good. And I know that's been a huge, like a huge thing. It's just like, yeah, highly, highly recommend. I I do, I do, I do do that. But Mm. before I have a shower, they are Bianca. It's called in um, Ayurveda. There's this, whole body oil massage, oh, right. deeply therapeutic, deeply nurturing, deeply nourishing. Oh, right. And the oil goes down apparently to your cellular level. Oh, just, um, and just that touch, so especially nourishing. during COVID. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just missing that yeah. warmth of like, yeah, touch. Yeah. What, um, so what oils? I usually use? use coconut or yeah. olive oil. I find olive oil oh, lighter, but I love cool. coconut. Yeah. So I don't yeah. smell <laughs> of coconut. Uh, when I was thinking about yoga and Ayurveda, I was thinking two things really help with um, imposter syndrome. One is Abhyasa, which again comes from yoga, which is taking a deep seat in practice. 
So it's like doing the work, showing up regularly, doing the work, being really prepared, mm. which I think most of us are pretty good at. Mm. Abhyas has really unsexy advice because nobody ever says, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that 90s hit. No, I'm too sexy for this show. Yeah. We're all a bit like that. We're like, I'm too sexy for the work. Uh, but the other things, so Abhyasa prepares you to act, uh, but vairagya. Vairagya is not being attached to the outcomes. I think we get our knickers mm-hmm. in a twist because we want it to look a certain way or be yeah. a certain way or we want the audience to respond a certain way. So do your best, but don't... It's like Neo from The Matrix. You've got to dodge the bullets of your own expectations. So our own expectations often set up these monstrous barriers for us. Mm. So both of those things can really help people. So the deep, a seat in, it's deeper than just practice and rehearsal. Abhyasa is the word. And vairagya, letting go of your expectations can really help people. Mm. Mm. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love both of those things. And yeah. I think like they're both really important. And something we've spoken about a bit is that you're not, um, you're not entitled to how people react to your work. You have no control Mm. over that. You will never be able to control that. So your job is just to make the thing, be as prepared as possible, make it as well as possible with as much love and care as possible. But what happens after you create that, you, it's, it's not your job at that stage, Mm. you know, to, to try and control how people will react to it or what they'll get out of it. Cause you, you'll always fail at that. (laughs) That's it. And it's that approval seeking in all of us that can then keep us very vanilla because if you're always looking for approval or to do the right yeah. thing or be perfect, then it holds that creativity back. Yeah, I love that. So what are what are some of your practices, your mental health yeah. toolkit that you use yeah. on a daily basis or, or semi-regularly? Yeah, I find very similar to you. It's actually very linked, all of those things. You can't take them apart mm. discreetly, but definitely journaling, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you always, but I'm re- I've restarted it this year. So even I go in and out of it. Yeah. I discovered Artist Way when I was really stuck with writing my third book. Mm. And I did all, it was sitting on my bookshelf. It had come highly recommended. I started reading it and I started writing. And when I'd written the last word, 50,000 words in my book, was when I'd read the last page of Artist Way. Oh, wow. So for any creative, if you're blocked, I'd highly recommend go back, revisit the book. It really helps. So definitely morning pages. I do a walk and I try to do a sunrise walk. Oh, wow. So Day, think, a daily sunrise Yeah, walk. most, most yeah. days. So I think there's a golden hour at sunrise and sunset. Mm. So I try to capture that. Uh, for, some t- for a few months, I've stopped yoga, but I also do yoga with a teacher. Um, try and do, if you can't meditate, my other alternative is to do the sit spot. Okay. It's an idea from Claire Dunn, who wrote Rewilding the Urban Soul. We can do a list later of some of the books. On oh, your, that would be um, amazing. And right? she says, find a spot. And this is ideal... Because whenever you ask a room, you say, shut your eyes. How many of you meditate? Like half the room will put up their hands because their eyes are shut. And you say, how many of you have tried and failed? Most of the people put up their hand as well. <laughs> so you have to have something for those people. Mm. Because there's always solutions in life. So there's a sit spot. She says, find a spot every day. It's got to be the same spot where you just sit and you're immersed in nature. You can do it for five minutes, ten minutes. You're just watching the clouds, the trees, the grass, little ants and bees. I've got a beautiful sit spot in Rocket Park near where I live that I either meditate in or I use it just as a sit spot. And I find all that greenery just being in nature in silence. Mm. Yeah, so no technology and all of that really helps. Um, I have a ritual of silence every morning and I find that really grounds mm. me, particularly given our work we was making all the time. Mm. <laughs> yeah. and that silence and then doing some of my writing. Yeah. And of course, like you, the gym and connecting with my friends. Uh, makes all the work mm. difference, uh, but often, like especially during COVID, we there's that wonderful poem by Damien Bar where he said, "We're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Mm. Some of us are in a in a yacht, while others barely have an oar. Mm. So we really don't know what's happening for people. So I think it's wonderful that we're having this discourse about mental health and what we can do. Yeah, but I also recognize our privilege." Of, like completely. our work and where we live and all of that makes all of this possible. Yeah, yeah. And it's all happening within such a frame of of possibility that's and created by and privilege. And autonomy and control yeah. and financial freedom. And, of, you know, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are your 
what's the next sort of year of your life looking like? Like what's, <laughs> what's on your plate mentally and work, yeah. life, heart, all of the yeah. I feel finally you've given me a segue to talk about my new book. <laughs> <laughs> what's next in your story? Yeah, I'm, like, that is, I mean, I'm going to narrow the question right down. You go, no, I want to, want to be that granular. I wanted to go broad, big picture. Please, can we talk about it? We want to hear, yeah. Um, definitely, uh, over the last two years, I've been on a journey on helping people unleash their X factor. So it's like your superpower when you present. And my research is everyone has X factor potential. Cute. Yeah. Love it. So, Love because it. the old fashioned view yeah. is like, it's very exclusive. Either you're born with it mm-hmm. or you're not, or it's all about sequence and showmanship. But this is much more about being able to bring something uniquely personal to your work. S- Okay, and so that's what yeah. X Factor is, something yeah. that's uniquely personal Yeah, to a you. combination usually of three things that makes it unique to you. So while X Factor can be many things, and it is, and I would never just be myopic, in my book I figured out the one way to pin down something that's notoriously unpin downable is I help people craft an X Factor statement. So this is like your personal tagline. So my personal tagline is with what I shared. It's the world's only economist turned Bollywood dancing business storyteller. Mm. When I worked with Carolyn Tate, whom I mentioned earlier, we came for her, it was ex-banker turned river swimming eco-explorer. So I help you find that unique combination of three things that can become your X factor statement. Yeah. It works on many levels. You can obviously use elements of that in your presentations. So you can tell stories about river swimming or I can teach Bollywood dancing. But it works deeper than that to transform even your identity. You start to see yourself as that. And it's something unique you can bring into your personal work, mm. into your professional work, um, and to really create the shift you want to want to create. And so with those three things, Yamini, is there a structure? Like, do you have, it, I mean, it sounds, maybe it's just the two examples that you yeah. gave, but there was one element that was where you came from, one element that was somewhat personal, one element no. that was professional where you are now is yeah. that a story that just happened to be the two examples <laughs> For both that you of gave us it happened like that so yeah. you picked up some of the nuances so like take people through a process so sometimes your ex-fact will have a journey like mine does mm. like economist to where i am now and similar with carolyn uh, one of our other friends is a role for my writer's group di percy she's got um, bank advisor forest dweller soul worker bank advisor forest dweller soul worker so i almost felt dies had a head body and a soul element oh, to her X Factor. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have a yeah, journey because she still does all those three things. But it's, yeah, it's tapping yeah, into those different yeah, levels. Dimensions. Yeah, fascinating. So, so I give people a process where you work through your provenance, your history and your heritage, your hobbies, your nerdy bits to then come up with a possible combination that works for you. Uh, it's been really powerful. It's uh, It's been fun. And I think the thing about X Factor is you've got to have fun with it. We've all got to lighten up a bit. Don't you reckon we all take ourselves a little bit too seriously? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. so it just gives you that permission to be the best version of yourself when you're presenting. So the worst advice you can give a presenter is be yourself. It's like telling someone to relax in the dentist chair. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't want you to be yourself. I know you're both lovely people. I want you to be the sparkliest, the best version of yourself. On like stage. the drag version of yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like where your mind goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what the statement does. Mm. So the people who worked with it, like um, Kath Walters is a best-selling business coach. She got... Cycle path nerd, cycle path nerd, still water kayaker, occasional power napper. <laughs> and yeah. mm. So cycle path nerd, she said, just exploded her thinking. She thinks now we can even put in a six path uh, bike weight instead of a freeway, a six path freeway that's only for bikes. So it wow. just explodes yeah. what's possible. Yeah. So that's what I mean by it's very transformative. And it also can you get to hear you get to meet yourself from an outside perspective, which as you were saying, it's so much easier walking down the road, noticing what's beautiful in other people. And then the second it's you, you're so critical, but you're almost, you're cheating that system and and creating that narrative. And you get to almost like, yeah, you're seeing yourself at a distance. And to your point earlier about a story needing a hero, it's like you're, you're creating a version of you that feels 
Yeah. Like that's possible. That feels so like true. the most heroic version of you. Correct, and it's still authentic and it's yeah, still yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, gives you permission to be that exactly, and, that. Yeah. and to be excited to live into that. Like how yeah. cool to wake up and be a yeah. eco forest Explorer. dwelling, <laughs> forest dwelling, <laughs> soul worker, Bollywood <laughs> dancer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really energizing. Yeah, isn't it? it's really re-energizing. Oh. Yeah, it's really yeah, exciting, yeah. and it sort of ties beautifully into a few of like I'm just thinking back to we had Carissa on a couple of weeks ago, and she was we were talking about the power of names. And when we spoke to Dr. Marion Piper, she's got a little like um, mantra is that whatever I write, I invite. Wonderful. Um, and whatever I speak, I think, I think was the second yeah. part of that. But all of these things, you know, it's interesting the more we do this and seeing these patterns start to yeah. emerge that like these, these things, the way that we use words or, or draw pictures or how we represent ourselves as stories yeah. that we tell ourselves – is so powerful in it terms is, of what we then feel we can step into and embody and mm. wake up feeling excited to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Oh. Well, I think we're probably just about the time where we'll wrap it up, but is there, I mean, what's what's the ultimate happy happy ending of your story? <laughs> is there, what, and we've spoken about what you've got immediately going on now, but... Um, but we, but do we, what, what's your sort of ideas for the future, for your future story, do you uh, think? Yeah, just think I'm just so grateful. I, I feel I, I, have, I love my work. It's like dream work. So I'm so grateful to be doing it. And just this constant being able to create, whether it's in my head or create an idea like X Factor, put it out in the world, yeah. see how it's received. Uh, that really lights me up. I can see that. Yeah. Just the way <laughs> you're speaking about it. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really been... Such a privilege to chat oh, about this stuff. I'm so you. excited for your book. And oh, thank you. Yeah, thank I'm, you for mentioning the book again. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I, this is, is cold again. <laughs> I was literally, I'm like, and, uh, but see, for, in all seriousness, like on that note, where can people find you? Websites, yes, socials, books. All of that. Yeah, where it's just my name go? and surname, yamaninaidu.com.au. I'm really good on LinkedIn, less good on Instagram, but that's pretty much where I am. Great. Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll pop links to all of thank your you. stuff in the show notes. And um, thank you oh, so much, Yamini, for your, so your much. generosity. And I've written down about twenty thousand things <laughs> to link to in the show notes as well. So all of the references we'll try to get in there for you. Yeah. And um, Yamini, just seeing someone speak with such passion about their work, you know, your your face lights up oh. when you can talk <laughs> yeah. when you talk about this stuff. And I can tell that it's you know. It truly, truly excites you and, and is the thing that brings you joy. Yeah, so thanks for sharing yeah. your joy with us. And yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yesami. Thanks, Alice. Thank what a joy. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Good luck. Yeah, Podcast <laughs> should be a big blockbuster. <laughs> Yay. 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 Okay, see you next time, see Alice. You next Bye, time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Imposter Syndrome Club. Please follow us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're feeling extra kind, rates and review. Or if you got any insights or value from this, share with a friend. You can also find us on Instagram at ImpostorPod or online at ImpostorSyndromeClub.com. 